first item is, um, now wait, we don't have a public speaking, oh, only at the end. Only for items. Specific item, but I don't see an item. Oh, right there. I forgot. Does the public speak first or second or? Uh, it's pub the public can speak after the yeah, presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So oh. Jump into number one. I want to jump into number one. All right, so this is an issue regarding uh, annexation, possible annexation with uh, some areas that are now in the VID service area. So Rob and James are going to talk us through this issue. Yeah, so I'm going to start off and talk uh, about the general over, uh, overview of what we're talking about, and then we'll get into some specifics, and Rob will take over on specifics of certain areas that we're looking at currently with VID. So in general, if you look at the larger 11 by 17 map, there's two areas, and they're not defined on this map, that we, between the agencies, call them the Boot and Bennett area. Because uh, mm -hmm. it used to look, one area it used to look like a boot. <laughs> and basically, it follows the flume. In general, it follows the flume, and it's a VID's area. LAFCO, many, many decades ago, has said that, hey, this is within the Dallas Hills sphere of influence, and it should be taken over by Dallas Hills. In our master plan, it said that for many iterations of the master plan. VID has said it in many iterations of their master plan. So everybody's on board. And a little bit of history on that is, is the old border wars back in the Stanley Marr days and the, uh, what's the uh, Aqua Last Breakfast called? The, the, the Hans Doe Breakfast. And the Hans, oh, Doe. Hans Doe. Hans Doe Breakfast and, and Marr days. Uh, that's where the border wars came from because we were trying to take over their area. They were trying to take over our area. And there's some history of that. That's all ancient history. But that's, that's where that terminology. We used to have a border wars golf competition you know, in commemoration of that <laughs> years ago, which I think the last one that we did was the first year I was, second year I was here. A dozen years ago. A dozen years ago. Like years jousting ago. and... Yes. So, yeah. so what's happened over the course of many decades is properties have come in as they develop. And as they develop, they come in uh, like any other developer. They would pay annexation fees to us. They pay their cap fees to us. They have to build the infrastructure. Um, over the course of the years, uh, a lot of difficult properties where there's either older infrastructure or infrastructure that comes directly off the flume, or it just doesn't make sense because it's just a single little property and they'd have to put a large sum or large dollar amount of pipelines in. But VID has a pipeline right in front. So we've, we, and the board sees this through exchange agreements or exchange mm -hmm. contracts that come to the board. So these are becoming more and more common. And uh, the previous district engineer, uh, which just retired, uh, Brian Smith and I sat down probably a year and a half ago, two years ago, roughly a year and a half ago. And he's saying, you know, we're getting to the point now where it's either occupied property, uh, there's areas where everybody, it's already occupied property, or it's areas that the real, realistically for them to come in and build infrastructure to just do a traditional annexation is is insurmountable, the amount of infrastructure they'd have to build. But VID has infrastructure, and since the original intent of LAFCO was the kind of annexation, we started talking about this. Now, uh, both agencies were in, not in a rush. We had other projects, but it's still been kind of in the background. So basically, if you look at the areas, the areas remaining are probably about 1,268 acres of areas remaining. And we're looking at kind of uh, just kind of getting a temperature of the committee on um, a concept of overall looking for an annexation in the future of how to approach it. But before we do that, there's five smaller areas which are kind of down here in the southeastern portion that I'm going to hand this over to Rob that we're looking at doing something more immediate with because there's a need there. Rob, you want to start talking about Yeah, this? so just on the overall concept of this too, nothing mm -hmm. is pressing on this here. It's in it's in a lot of plans here. LACO's service review also includes all this about us progressively or eventually taking this over. But there's nothing written in stone that says we have to do a by such and such date here. Um, but when uh, we talked with Brian Smith here uh, last year, he brought up this little pilot program here, uh, which is these five areas that James just talked about. Uh, and these are kind of off the El Norte Parkway, mm -hmm. uh, Woodland Parkway area here. 
mm -hmm. uh, that we might want to take a look at, we could take over from VIB. And so it's just kind of, well, the devil's in the details. How do we go about this? And just because to give you a reference, obviously, this red line going across is the 78, and this red line going up and down is the 15. Is what? 15. 15. Oh. Yeah, so you got area one, which is uh, off of, well, technically it's off Borden Road, I guess. And then as Borden Road turns into Eleanor to Parkway as you go east, you have the areas two, three, and four. And then area five is kind of out in the Calavo area uh, to the east of uh, uh, Nordahl Road, actually. But they thought this one might, might be a good place to kind of do a little pilot study just to see if we can kind of come up with a concept of how to how to kind of put a program together you know, for how it. to approach a future mass annexation or mass exchange. <coughs> and yeah. these areas are also islands. And, and one of the things yeah. that we want to try and get rid of from uh, LAFCO and both agencies <coughs> standpoint are, are these kind of isolated islands. So there's infrastructure that this uh, irrigation has here that they are talking about having VWD take over. There's infrastructure that VID is talking about constructing themselves and then giving to us as well. To our standards. Right. Okay. Uh, to physically um, serve these different areas. And then there's the concept of, you know, the cost and the details here. How do we make this go about? So all these five areas, they're almost 31 acres total in land here. So we're not talking a massive amount of area. Uh, but the length of new pipeline that would need to be installed by VAD is about 2,800 feet. So it's not insignificant. It's a good chunk of change. Mm -hmm. And then they would also give us about 3,580 feet of their own infrastructure. Now does that infrastructure when they give it to us is we accept it as is or are known or they have to bring it to a standard a, or that's a that rob's going to get to oh. that great right no that, that that's yeah. that's a great segue actually <laughs> because uh the answer is yes it is as is basically and then so the question came up well it's not new infrastructure some of it's fairly aged what's the life expectancy of it what what really would bwd bwd be taking over at that point and so they agree there, there's probably a cost associated with the aging here. And one thing that Brian kind of came up with here is some type of comp compensation for that based on the age of the pipe and the life remaining on that pipe. And so that's kind of what I have listed on my spreadsheet here. What's the benefit to uh, Vista? So pretty simply, uh, if you look at Vista service area on the overall map, it's over here off the map. Uh, so for them to service and pro provide proper response time and services to people, they have to go way out of their normal service area. So from an operational standpoint, that's the first benefit is, is really they can't really provide these people adequate service and response times as normal mm -hmm. I and mean, they, they, they have to the other thing that they're very interested in is is they want to pressurize their flume um, and to do that there's you know these connections you know not all but many of them come off the flume and to pressurize the flume they would have to sever these connections so if they pressurize the flume they can get more water from their water rights over to their system so they get they have some advantages the other thing is if you look at every one of these areas not not everyone but a big portion of these areas they're little dead-end systems for them and every little dead-end system doesn't have redundancy doesn't have prop you know there's there's issues with that and in some of the areas not all of them have some older infrastructure which they're going to whether based on this methodology they're going to have to pay for one way or another but in a lot of those areas we have infrastructure that is newer and more adequate that has redundancy because we're surrounding them if you you know so instead of one pipe coming into a whole neighborhood you know we have four five six connections that say the neighborhood that could be made mm -hmm. okay and then how does this besides being a good neighbor and making the system more sensible how does this help us or is the disadvantage that we're getting and do taking these on well, that, that, that's where the cost discussion yeah. came in here. Okay, and so and really, so the benefit could be money. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and I know you're gonna. You're saying, well, the pipes could be. So what I'm saying is, if we were to take on this little isolated, because I know these are confusing spots, yeah. and not just for us and for them and everybody trying to address it, but um, do they make our district better that we don't have? It doesn't necessarily or make our district better, um, but it doesn't really impact our system with having these additional customers either. For instance, if we take these customers on, we're not looking at, we need more storage or we need more pumping capacity. It's, it's not triggering any expansions, yeah. for instance. We could take these customers on in our existence. And do you know if how many customers overall we're talking about? We're talking... I see the area, but just that curiosity. That was yeah. actually didn't take a while ago. Yeah, we've got 40, we're, we're talking a couple hundred. Couple hundred. Um, yeah. Are you talking about the, the five um, pilot areas? The five the is a couple hundred. You know, let's, let's call it about 150. 150 more in the five. And what if yeah. you took the whole district on? Well, that's that's a big complicated number. Uh, a lot of those areas in the Boot and Bandit are undeveloped. Yeah. These areas, so there's not current so customers. Homes yeah. These are areas. undeveloped. A lot of these areas are here are undeveloped. A lot of these areas yeah. here are already developed. Okay, so what we're going to talk about now is what do we want to do about these five? And I just want to, don't want to yeah. set up a policy that then we have to, now we have to revamp it. So what you're saying is these larger outreaches are undeveloped. Yep. Mm -hmm. So they come with their own individual challenges, plus and minus. So our policy at this point won't change in that we'll look at annexing them or not. Correct? Is that what we're trying to decide how to do these? Well, so more. And I guess. I mean, I, I would like the, the committee to start thinking about this from a policy perspective. Okay. Say, is this something you want to do? Take them on. Don't don't worry about the five. And if you're okay with the concept of yes, ultimately we'd like to absorb all those into mm -hmm. our service area. Would you like to start with these five? And then okay. We can learn from that That's without obligating ourselves to doing the remaining. And, and allow me to expand on kind of what what you've said about this. So you know, as 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 you, you know, we're we're a neutral. We're a nonprofit. So taking on these customers don't really provide us with anything additional as far as revenue or anything for right. that expense. Uh, the, what Rob was indicating too is there's life expenses that are high if they've collected some of that for replacement value and that's that 290000 that you guys see now. Uh, plus they'd be building infrastructure uh, along mm -hmm. with that, which is that 3,500 million feet. However, um, from Val Cio's point of view, our infrastructure is in general newer surrounding their infrastructure. So there's the reason why there's no impact is we have multiple connections to it. We have also a higher fire flow rating. Some of their infrastructure is older, they have lower fire flow. So there's no triggers that would cause upsides. But in discussion, as areas come in, if there were triggers, then VID would have to make that decision of whether they would have to upgrade that system or not. So to make sure that we're, our existing ratepayers are, are really not, are, are held harmless you know, if, if this move were to move Did forward. You have a question? If, uh, <clears throat> whether it's the private program or the ultimate program, if we annex these areas into our district mm -hmm. and then the uh, undeveloped properties show up, do they then have to pay the annexation fee or is that already done for them? No, in theory, if if the policy was to do a, a mass kind of annexation, we need to study it first off mm -hmm. to, to understand what that really meant. Uh, at least that would be my recommendation to, to Glenn to get somebody on board to study it to see if there is any larger issues. They would be annexed in, but the undeveloped areas, since they don't have meters, they don't have infrastructure, they would, like any other developer, have to build the infrastructure. Oh, yeah. They have to pay their cap fees. So right. There, there, so that would remain, but the annexation, and it, and it, there's nothing. There's no policy at this point, so it could be handled in a hybrid sort of way too. Okay. But the annexation, in theory, you know, if you did it for the what we're talking about for this five and, and apply it to everybody, would be waived okay. or, or paid for through in like contribution or or still be charged. I, that's what we're kind of here to discuss. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of up in the air. There, there's really three choices with the annexation. Do we still charge it, do we waive it, or do we ask for a contribution? So for instance, when one of these areas does develop, 
and they ask to be served by us, we do require them to annex into our district. Right so now, we do oh, yeah, right. Of course, fees. and that's some serious yeah. dollars. If during this process, if we decide on the pilot program and ultimately on the major program, if we annex it in with VID just gifting us whatever and doing this payment and rebuild, then it's we're in the district. That is properties are in the district. If the de undeveloped property shows up, he has to build his infrastructure and everything, but he would not have to pay the annexation fee. Well, just to kind of focus on the five, I think what we've written down for the five right now is there's three different issues. There's the there's the infrastructure that needs to be built, which VID has yeah. said we're going to build it to your standards. Mm -hmm. There's the contribution for replacement, because they've been collecting mm -hmm. money for replacement of that infrastructure, which is at two hundred ninety thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, now you know, let's say it's a million dollars worth of infrastructure that we'd be taking over, and we're going to get two hundred ninety thousand. And in theory, mm -hmm. if the pipeline expectancy lasts as long as it should. And their assumptions were reasonable. We're uh, neutral. We're in. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're yeah, then it's neutral. So that 290 is money that we get now, however, it'd be used for replacement of that infrastructure in the yeah. future. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's still annexation fees uh, to discuss, which Rob mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. about that 143. Yeah, about that 143,000, which staff is not saying we're waiving that at the point. Right. And then there's um, uh, basically capacity fees. And that's eight hundred and is that a nine ninety three thousand? Yeah, eight ninety three. Eight hundred ninety three thousand. Now, there is a valid argument that that the capacity fees should be waived because they already their existing customers they already have their water meters they already have their connections uh, and they're not increasing. We don't have to build infrastructure for them. Right. At all, and so they're not they're not increasing because of the the nature of it. However, I don't know if that would apply. For the whole two one thousand two hundred plus acres, right? But for these five, it would make sense. Uh, but but all those items are still up for discussion. Right. I, but I think what Jim is, was pointing out, if I can step in on top of you, mm -hmm. or you can pick me up here, um, is what we're saying is we're looking at the whole picture, and what he's saying is if we annex them and waive the fee. Um, we know we'll still, as a developer comes in, he'll still pay capacity like an arm of and he'll, you know, we'll do the infrastructure and all that stuff will be built. What we would be losing, technically, as a district is the possibility of the annexation fee. So, yeah. now, yes. is it, if we are to annex this property before a developer, before anyone's doing anything with it, mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of expense in our annexing, is that correct? And is that where the district just would waive it or would we well I, I don't think we would waive it if it was if it was just a developer that was already in our service area or wanted to be added to our no, service I'm talking area. about us just generically using yeah, going in and we're just gonna say all right we agree we, we this is where we're headed we're just gonna take it all in now isn't that what your uh, overall policy no I think what that's what I was trying to uh, create I don't believe staff is saying we are recommending recommending or even implying that we should waive annexation fees. Okay. Right, I think that's probably a yeah. But VID there. may be asking us to. Okay. Oh, for waiving the annexation fee to VID yeah. coming in. Yeah, we're not saying, uh, the staff is not recommending in our presentation to you today that the annexation fee is off the table. Right. Okay, wait, I'm going to stop you for one second. I'm getting confused. First of all, I'm not sure what general policy you want, and then you said we're going to come up with a policy, mm -hmm. and then we can fine tune it for these five properties which are in front of us right now. Okay, the general policy to me, you're talking about undeveloped land, and a lot, you know, a, you're talking 30 acres out of 1,268 acres, basically. 31 acres is what we're talking mm -hmm. about, right. the five. Mm -hmm. But we still have, you know, 1,237 acres out there. Are you asking us to look at a policy to cover the 1,268 acres? So we have a general policy which we're saying normally when we annex we're, we're going to ask for all these things. That's going to be our policy and then we take that policy and we have 
individual negotiations where we decide on this one, we cannot waive the annexation. The capital fees we want, we think we're entitled to some of the capital facility fees because those people haven't been necessarily paying for the desal to us or whatever, but maybe it's a different percentage. So I'm, that's why I'm confused. So, so, cause I see annexation fees a little differently in the two situations. Yeah. So I don't know what we're trying to, do you know what we're trying to do? Well, I think, I, I think we have to separate the two. Yeah. Yeah. Separating the two, in my opinion, I think the pilot program makes good sense because I, if, if I would not take the, an, the annexation fees off the table either. Mm -hmm. If they want this done, they're going to pay the right, annexation fees. We're going to take yeah. it over. There's a benefit to you. Once we have taken it over, it's like any other property in our district. If, you're, if it's undeveloped, you show up, you get put in your infrastructure, water main, all that. But the annexation, there is no annexation <coughs> fee. So for the five parcels to begin with, to see how that goes with VID and see what their reaction is, because if we set this precedent here, then they're going to go, oh my gosh, there's 1,200 acres uh, times, I mean, that's uh, 10, 20 times, 30, 40 times more. That's going to be a ton of money they're going to have to pay. So they may, they, I'm sure they're going to arm wrestle about that. So I'll tell you, we're kind of in discussion, you know, from a staff level, where uh, things seem to make sense to us, and then from there, uh, the, the committee kind of digest it and discuss it. So from an overall 1,200 acre policy, okay, you're, what seems to make sense to staff is if it's an existing resident or an existing structure, existing right. connection. Waving of cat fees would make sense because they already have their meter, they already have their connection. Uh, okay. If it's existing, mm -hmm. if it's vacant land, there is no waving of cat fees because they have to still purchase a meter. They have to connect into the system. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So as far as from, and that's for and that's for existing connections though. So if they're they have existing connections with BIT, there, there's a case that that would make sense. Yep. Right. But yep. what about the end? Let's take and the then, second. The so that's that's, that's, that's okay. a cafe. So existing connections, no cafe. No cafe, but we we are getting mm. money for replacement value because they have existing infrastructure. Yeah, right, right. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. For uh, and then of course just to finish that thought, when there's no connections, there's there's most likely either it's vacant land. There's most likely infrastructure that needs to be built anyway, and there's no there's probably less infrastructure we're taking over. They have to. Build the infrastructure, and that's the on replacement, the table. right? Yeah, that's and standard. That's that's standard. That. Our question okay. is: annexation from a staff perspective, just in discussion, whether it's existing connections or vacant land, the annexation is not waived. Oh. Okay. Okay. That's staff's position. Right. Yeah, it's a staff's position right now, and then uh, replacement costs, as discussed, we're looking at for existing infrastructure that we're taking over that we're inheriting. Our position is VID has collected money for replacement of that mm -hmm. infrastructure, and since we are now taking over that infrastructure, we should get our we should get the proper amount of that replacement value, which is in this case the two hundred ninety thousand. Yeah, and, it, and that's not tied to how much money VID has taken in. It's tied to what we think the replacement value yeah. of the pipe would be and how old it is. How right, much, is that much, what you call the de, life estimate? Yeah, mm -hmm. how depreciated is it? Well. I'm, my thought is, I, don't, I think that's very reasonable. I think that the annexation fees should not be waived, regardless if it's, that's what we normally do. Yeah. Um, waiving the capital fees, I think that that makes sense. I was saying I could also see that maybe there's a percentage, but if you don't, um, if they put in the replacement value and stuff they've given us, and you as a staff, Feel that capital's been taken care of by what they paid to the ID. Um, I'm okay with that. It's I didn't I I thought we were talking about waiving the annex. And I was like no no no. Well yeah, but if if on the existing properties, mm -hmm. they're already cooked up. Right. Just because it's changed names, why would we send them a bill for annexing <coughs> their property into our district? Well, VID would have to pay. This is oh, VID would yeah. pay that. Right. Property owner would. Right. Property okay. Owner would. VID pays that. VID yeah. would pay that bill. Yeah. Oh, I can't. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and 
in my mind, I see a pushback on the larger properties, but for this 30 acre piece, yes, I see that. And that's for the existing. What about for the unexisting, or the undeveloped properties? Well, there's, there's two ways to handle it. If there's, um, if there's annexations that happen <coughs> in blocks of uh, existing customers first, then that could be one step, and then the, I, I could foresee, and, it, and the devil's in the details, as, as Rob says, that large blocks, especially up here in the north, of undeveloped property, the idea would probably just choose to wait. And yeah. Just, and just say, we will just say, well, when they develop, we'll automatically say you're going to Valacita us and go annex into them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's how I would envision it happening. And in, in some brief discussions <clears throat> with Brian before he retired, he, he was in agreement with that. But but I don't know if uh, Eldon's had a chance to really digest that at this point. So I don't know how much they've talked. Yeah, we're in the process of setting up another follow up meeting with the yeah. IDA to uh -huh. work out through these details, but we just want to start mm -hmm. the discussion with the committee. I don't know if it'd be realistic to. Uh, for VID to do a whole annexation and say, here's a humongous annexation check. Yeah. You know, I could see them saying, you know, we're going to do it in these areas that we know which. That have already been developed. That have already been developed, which is primarily this bottom yeah. area, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 15. And then we'll take care of these areas later on. But if we kind of have a set policy on how we're going to handle them, oh. then we know that every time they come in, it's per our policy. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess in my mind, I see what you're saying. I was assuming we would agree that we are going to annex everything, but we don't we don't get the annexation fee from VID for undeveloped land. When the undeveloped land came in, they would pay the annexation. The developer would pay the, the annexation. The developer would. Yeah. I wasn't mm -hmm. going to ask VID for I understand asking VID for the annexation for the people that are already there. I'm not going to go in and say to the people, you have to pay to be part of our district. That wasn't their decision and it wasn't there. But so I, I totally agree that, yeah, we, I guess in my head it's really one of those little technical things. Is it that you belong to VID until VID you develop and then you annex into us? Or do we clean the whole thing up? lay claim to that area I, I and then are reimbursed when the people come in to annex although they're not being annexed so you can't do that so well there's again i mean there's other yeah. area ways you can handle it you yeah. can set up a uh, assessment district that ha that equals the annexation fee for those people or something okay. like that. Mm -hmm. there's different areas that can be handled. if the idea was to clean up our areas yeah. and it, it is i mean like you said there's no real urgency to clean up the whole area mm -hmm. we can deal with the most prominent <coughs> discussions the 30 acre pilot the the area up in there uh, uh, north or south that is developed already mm -hmm. perhaps as a next step and then let's see what develops on the questionable parts out there so i think for today's meeting if we establish uh, a look at uh, some kind of direction for the 30 acres the pilot and, the, program. and the pilot program and then see if that is applicable to the resident that upper developed area in the future and or make the tweaks to make that work then I think we would accomplish a great deal and then let that is that north or south that it's kind of north west north, north, northwest yeah but isn't this the area that's that, the area yeah that's, yeah, that's the southeast that's south, the yeah, southeast, southeast area yeah. is where just we're leave that, that alone yeah, leave that alone oh leave it alone Leave that on alone today. This is the area that's pretty much developed. No, opposite. No, opposite. opposite. Oh, it's this opposite. is undeveloped. Yeah. Yeah, this is El Norte. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is developed. Okay. The upper part is a All right. Area. So that's yeah, undeveloped. Twin Oaks area. And this is the developed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then the other way around. Yeah. Deal, deal with the 30 <laughs> and the, the developed area. Leave this undeveloped area alone till the, later. And in my view, I think you hit it on the head. For the 30 acre piece, uh, bring it up to speed, pay for the annexation, and that'll take care of the existing and the undeveloped properties in this 30 acre piece. And if they come in, the undeveloped pieces will pay the capacity and fees, but they don't have to pay the annexation fees because they've already been done.
Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I understood what you. I understood the intent. Basically, uh, kind of the way Rob has laid it out, we would say to VID, we're looking at collecting annexation fees for VID for the developed area. We're looking at waiving uh, capacity fees since they already have their meters, they already have their connections. Mm -hmm. We're looking at obviously replacement value contribution. Mm -hmm for the existing infrastructure mm -hmm. and then building any new infrastructure to our standard <coughs> yep. 30 acres. And those are all the components of the 30 acre piece. And that's where our kind of... Uh, and waiving this capital facility. Yep. Okay. yep. Yeah, so... The, the, the which, which, as you can see, is, is the lion's share. Right, the, the, the except the for undeveloped except land <laughs> where yeah. they would still need to get service from us. Yep, because they don't have an existing yeah. meter. And, and that makes sense, because that trickles down. Because if we put in a new meter, we have to pay it. It's our cap fees. We have to pay CWA their cap fees for it. So, so as long as there's nothing that we have to provide that we don't already have, there is no capital. Right. We don't have to upsize facility. Damage. However, in the middle of this little thing, if there was a <coughs> one acre parcel and they decided to develop, and for some reason they had to do something, you had to, pay <coughs> they would pay for that mm -hmm. after because yeah. it would be considered. One of the things that this may spring, depending on the conversation with VID, because this is what uh, their, um, their now retired district engineer want to do, is get a consulting on board and to actually study the whole area, come up with those plans in writing, also come up with the infrastructure that would be needed to serve that area as an estimate, you know, high level, and, and also for us to actually see if any of our facilities are affected, which <coughs> they have to, whether it's storage or transmission. Uh, we don't believe it would be, but up in this area, depending on the development, that there's more potential for that. But if this area develops, we'd have to study it anyway. Right, I was going to say that seems like we're doing a double study, which so. I wouldn't want to pay for. Yeah, this is, in my honest opinion, this is all going to probably occur in three big phases or blocks. The first one's a pilot study, mm -hmm. uh, which we can... And I know, like the whole idea of Yeah. Pilot. And then the second part, though, is going to be when BID decides, <coughs> okay, we can annex all of our developed property mm -hmm. into BWD, but with that, we're also going to probably inherit their infrastructure in this area as well. When that happens, they really aren't going to have the ability to serve the balance of the properties that are undeveloped. They're going to tell them you got you got to go annex into BWD when you're ready to develop, and that would be the third phase, which will occur over time as all these guys come in. Yeah, but that's yeah. the three phases I see as well. How many parcels are we talking about? Is there a lot of individual ownership, or are there a lot of a lot of large? These hundreds. are larger parcels. Yeah, yeah. You, you, still, you got hundreds of properties. But I mean, in there. down in here, each one of these, these yeah, are those are small. I'm, I'm also, talking in the North Twin Oaks. Or, yeah, I don't, I don't have that. Yeah, number. North Twin Oaks has a lot of the larger properties, Glenn, like yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, where you got is, um, 20, 30 acre blocks. There's no one Sierra in this. No, they're over here. is not in this. I put over no. yeah, they're over here. I'm trying, I was saying, it doesn't look like you would be that maps. Yeah, they, they, they come up close this to it. This is further like, west. Yeah, they're like right here, yes. This is further west. This is uh, into going what? into those Vista Hills. Right. Okay. Yeah, parts of New here do come up close to some of these areas, but New here is completely within our district. That's what I thought. Currently. Mm -hmm. It's confusing. Okay, great. Um, okay, and I would say then if you need a direction, we think the pilot program is growing is great, but with the um, capital facility and existing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get the annexation, bring it up to speed, yeah. have it done to our staff. I think we're all on the same page then. Yeah. So our next steps so will be meeting with VID, letting them know that, and then seeing what, how they react. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. All, right. All right. And then you'll present yeah. some options to the board to find Right. Them. Yeah. If, if depending on the outcome yeah. of that meeting, if we're moving forward, we'll have to bring this back to the board. Yeah. So right. Yeah. Obviously, I just want to yeah. make sure we nope. didn't step on any toes. No. Okay. And if something changes dramatically, we need with the VIP, yeah, we'll, we'll come, come back. back. Excellent. Yes. All right. Okay. Oral. Oh, oh yes. Number. Our, what's it, our, our long list of speakers. How about Michael Hunting? Yeah. Thank you for putting me first. 
for last. <laughs> you are uh, the prime. This suspect. is only talking about water. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Is there any annexation issues with uh, wastewater? Well, this irrigation district only does water, so we're only talking about water in this aspect. So, we, if there's any development, the waste treatment will come later with these undeveloped. Yes, properties. yes, because in the wastewater, we would serve all of these different properties okay. currently. And a lot of these properties are already in our IDA. We already serve them, so yeah. not all of them, but a big portion of them. Mm -hmm. Now, is VID reading these meters? Are they taking some of our water and replacing it? And we, how is the water rights issues taken care of? So for a lot of these current customers mm -hmm. of VID, VID does serve them directly. They, exactly. And that's what James has seen off of their flume pipeline. So they have various distribution infrastructure for that. Do the property owners have any say in these annexations? Well, we've had some discussions actually with Brian on that as well, saying how do we handle that transition here? Because, you know, we have different rates than DID does. Right. Sometimes they're more, sometimes they're less. It just depends on, well, on the year. Considering our last urban water plan, we're going to be charging a lot more probably. So, do we get an offset in rights? No, uh, well, Go ahead. so from the rights here, from like the county water authority's perspective yeah. here, we would just basically, once the transfers are complete, the next plan comes along, we certainly mention it here saying, we have these additional properties now, so we would probably need a larger allocation. It, it, well, it's a balance. That it's a balance. So it comes mm -hmm. off of VID. Yep. It goes to us. Right. Right. So but it, I'm it, saying, shouldn't that be part of the policy to get that established? It's automatic. It a, it's automatic. With, it, in matter of fact, in all of our exchange agreements right now, mm -hmm. and you've asked this question at board meetings uh, before, Mr. Hansaker, is you when we have those exchange agreements, and you've asked, well, how does that work? It's basically, if we're serving a VID customer, all that water doesn't come out of our bucket, so to speak. It comes out of VID, even though it came through our pipes. So in this case, we'd be serving VID customers and they'd be permitted, so the, it would come out of their bucket automatically. It's already set up that way within the policies of the CWF. Right. It makes sense to rationalize these historical oddities, remnants. Um, so these are VID meters, they're being read. Uh, shouldn't we require some upgrades in the type of meters? Absolutely. So one of the things that Rob mm -hmm. put down on, on that form is they're going to upgrade the infrastructure, new infrastructure, and upgrade it to our standards, which includes meters that we can read with our meter reading systems. Yeah, we'll bring the meters up to our what we use here, which is the iPros typically. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to recognize when this comes up before the board, specifically state that this is our for fully developed internal uh, properties, and that any undeveloped or developable developable properties have to be considered in a separate process. We'd like the policy to kind of capture both, and and that's what you know, uh, we, we wanted to discuss with the board here is how do we do it with existing or, you know, currently developed properties and how do we do it with undeveloped properties? Yeah. And yeah, there, there's probably some differences like we were talking about collection of the capital facility right. fees. Right. right. One. <coughs> Are there <coughs> undeveloped properties within these five pro pilot programs? Yeah. Yeah. So, as I was saying, when those folks show up, they're going to put in their infrastructure, they're going to pay their capacity fees, but the annexation fee will already be yeah. taken care of. Yeah, because basically we're just taking out islands. And yeah, right. Majority and of, majority of we're not going to double dip on somebody, yeah. so mm -hmm. right. this is going to pay for it. When they show up, they get the benefit like anyone else in our district that's undeveloped. That they're, already, they're already in there, and, the and, district. And just so to be clear, our master plan has, has assumed over time that we will be serving 
all this area. Right. So mm -hmm. from a long range planning standpoint, there is no difference. Yeah. Okay. Very true. Okay, so. Some of these properties you're talking about up by Newland Sierra. Newland Sierra is uh, buying up a bunch of these properties. So uh, that should be considered in the fray. Well, their current 1,985 acres here is completely within our, our service area. Right, but they're buying if other they, additional plots and it isn't clear that uh, whether or not those are really included uh, for development in the BWD. Like as far as what they're they They're not part of the project if they're buying them. They haven't brought them forward. Right. Okay, well that, you know, like they're buying VID. If it's outside of this, they're buying VID at this time. Well, and Nothing's happening yeah, with it. They have to be. They have to be part of the project because right. it's gone before the planning it, commission. It's not New and Sierra. No. Yeah. It's just yeah. the same yeah. company. It may yeah. be the same company, but yeah. I'm saying it's not New and Sierra. And therefore, it, what we're saying is it's all in the, I mean, I can't do any one thing about, with anyone who comes in and buys this entire strip of properties. It's, right. Well, that's, right now, it's still in the ID. Right. But they're buying easements. And access rights and such, okay. which will go into the project, so and that's going to be a problem because they're making changes even before, even after the EIR is going through. Yeah. But, but not with water. I, think I don't think that's our issue. Yeah, yeah, we're off. Okay, totally we're off. We're off. Okay, we're thank totally you. Totally off. Sorry. All right. Okay. Number two, the dis Disposition? Oh, you're not done? No, no. He's throwing me out of here. Oh, get out of here. He's got a lot of work to do. Granted, he was free. Did we answer all your questions? Thank Did you we so give much. you the direction? Yeah. Yes. You did Good. great. Yeah, thank you. All right. I want your house colored. Huh? I want your house and my house colored. <laughs> no, well, I don't, I don't, color, I don't, don't color it in. I don't want anybody to no, know no, where I don't, don't want to know yeah. yeah, we have those maps. <laughs> I know what you do. We, we know. I'm wearing my tin uh, hat. Okay, so we do have some on our uh, my phone number two. Okay, the district vehicle number nine. All right, uh, Chris. Did yep. You get so uh, I was at the board meeting back in in June, and from the previous. Uh, Public Awareness Personnel Policy Committee, there was questions about, hey, can we bring the uh, vehicle out to community events and so forth? And so I went and talked to the staff, and, and it sounds like the vehicle was, you know, refurbished, and it was really not that long ago, but really it was 11 years ago. <laughs> so it's continued to deteriorate oh. at that point. Yeah. The last time it was really used in an official capacity was about seven or eight years ago at Christmas parade. Yep, down. I was there. And uh, You broke it? Mm-hmm. The, the question at the board meeting was, you know, get us some additional details on, you know, the, the various options. What will it cost? Or what will the revenue bring? So to keep it in an operating condition, to just kind of keep it running and, and use it uh, for whatever purposes, uh, to make it street legal right now, there's no seatbelts in it. Uh, it would probably cost about $10,000 just maintenance on it. Um, a full restoration, I think one of the board members, you know, requested information on a, on a, on a, on a full, full restoration, and that's really where you're taking the, the frame off and getting all the parts back to original conditions, forty to $50,000. Um, auction, um, Haggerty estimate was for a vehicle and its status about, you could get revenue of about $9,000. Um, putting in the lobby, staff time on a weekend, probably close to $2,500. Uh, putting it out in the garden, uh, getting some sort of covering for it, uh, and putting some signage out there, uh, a little more than $1,100. And then the other option to, for me to research was to, you know, what would it take to donate it to the San Marcos Historical Society? So I spoke with Panis, and her situation is pretty fluid. Um, she's got the, um, Historical Society out there and they've got usage of the property, but it's not specifically theirs. It's really city property and a Recent study was done. I think their area as she explained it. It's like a floodplain. So mm -hmm. it's classified maybe in a 
more dangerous status than was originally previously classified. And when you go out there, you kind of see there's hills, hills, and hills. And they're yeah. kind of at the bottom of it. What she thinks and what she's trying to get uh, approved through the city is they have an old fire truck. There was a concrete pad out there that a caretaker's, I think, mobile home or maybe a manufactured home yeah. was on. Yeah. But it's basically falling apart. It's going to have to be demolished and taken down, but they've got still the concrete pad. She's looking to get a garage from down near the old Boys and Girls Club, maybe transport it out, put it out there, and it could house both that fire truck and, if we wanted to donate it, the uh, vehicle number nine. So it's an option, but it's fluid, and there's there's no answer for me to give you on, can we do this tomorrow? She can't, she can't really take it at this point. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Go ahead. Well, I was out there just this morning to take a look around. I do know the area with the trailer was for the mm -hmm. the uh, resident ranger at one time, um, and uh, because the area where we have our sign and our little window and everything, there's just no room to put something there. <clears throat> so then, knowing and I've known Tannis for thirty years. She's tenacious. She'll probably get something done someday. Um, and that something done someday is going to be predicated on somebody else doing fundraisers to get this thing built in this garage and moved and all. <clears throat> That's, in my opinion, years down the road. Um, spending any, I was, <laughs> I was at that parade the last time we used that vehicle. And, it, and okay, it was cute and had an old sign. I guess, I guess the <clears throat> um, historical information on that is that was one of the first vehicles in the district. It was not. It was probably the first vehicle, but it wasn't the first piece of equipment that the district had, which is why it's numbered number nine. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So there's some historical value, possibly. If, in my opinion, I don't think Tannis can take it, is it causing us any trouble just to leave it where it is now in our house? You know, it's, it's taking up space and yeah. the maintenance bay. That's about yeah. it. They're yeah, not, exactly. They're not actively maintaining it. No. I don't think. You know, they may put air in the tires once in a while. They, I don't know if they trickle charge the battery, but it's, it's not a, a big effort. But it is taking up space that we prefer to use for something else. Somebody had suggested we put it in the lobby of our office. That's, I think that's, 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 that was Chris. That, well, it's not really mine, it's Eric's, but I liked it, and, I, and there's room in there for it, and we could put it in I there. guess what I need to do is go look at it again. It's been a long time, a couple of years, since I've looked at the size of it. It's not really that big. It's, 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 it's a 46 like vehicle. Car. No, no, it's, a, it's the old World War II Jeep. I know, Jeep. But it doesn't in my head. Yeah. Well, well, I'll take a look at it. I already caught. Yeah. I didn't ever sleep on one. So <laughs> well, I've seen it, pictures. I've been in enough it's of them. It's about as big as half the table. Yeah. Oh. It's about as wide as the table. It's about as big as it is. People weren't as wide as we are today. Exactly. All right. They'd be like this next time. Okay. Personally think it's not, I think it Makes no sense to put it in the lobby. I mean, it, it, okay, it's old. It's a vehicle. It, 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 there's no connection to it other than it was ours and it was one of our fir our first vehicle. Okay, big deal. Put a picture on the wall. You got the same thing. Mm, well, I'm going to disagree because okay. I think if it's in the lobby and we do have kids and stuff that come, it's a real exciting thing to them. Not a picture on the wall. They aren't very excited about pictures on the wall. Especially if it's just an old car. Yeah. Um, so I but then we're going to have to rope it off because. But, but I think putting it in the lobby at $2,500 is not the full story. Because if you put it in there, you would want it to be not in the condition it's in, it sounds like. Well, I was including that. You know, they, okay. they, 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 would, they would take the take, fluids take out it, on that side. Take it out yeah. and put it up. And yeah. Yeah. Does it look worn out or does it look. Decision. It looks, it looks good. It's got a clean okay. paint job said, on it. You know, it's an old. All right. And then is it something that anyone could sit on to take pictures? I sat on it just a week ago. I mean, would it would it hold up to if you had a class and kids wanted to 
because then I can see it has, it says something about us and it does say our history. What I'm, do, and, and I like it going out to the garden, but I don't, and I know they need a garage, but putting the fire truck and the Jeep in a garage hides them as well. So unless they build something that's real obvious, you know, it's like when you go out to any park, if you have to go into a building to see something, you may, especially, a little, especially those kinds of things. Sure. Walk into the hangar and the planes hit. Sure. So um, I think it'd be great if we could donate to them. It would be good because we have our little history out there and it's appropriate. But I think the lobby's more interesting. Um, I understand $9,000 selling it would be nice, but sometimes I think we forget what we have is our history. Yeah. And I do think that's important. Um, that's just me, that's my opinion. I'm sure there's a lot of people who would say, oh, who cares if there's, I don't think our lobby is interesting at all, personally. You walk, it's very efficient, well, sorry. Um, general manager the board pictures some are ideas. way too big. <laughs> treat mine but um you know i think we could do more for our lobby i think there's things that I, that's just my opinion i don't suppose it would stand up in the garden and we also said um we could put it in the gar garden as well where would you put it then i think more down towards the employee entrance gate it wouldn't be in the front portion where citizens drive in that's really an attractive nuisance and you get people wanting to come right. over and, and mess with it. So you're talking it. about this end? Yeah, kind of down towards the employee parking lot. That's me. I, I share so. your thoughts about keeping pieces of our history. I was listening to the radio this weekend, and there was a, they were talking about the Super Bowl coming up, or that will be coming up. And they, they said that the video footage from Super Bowl One, they used the tape, they re-recorded over it, because they didn't think anybody would want to ever <gasps> see it again. So they have no permanent record of it. And obviously people looking back, it's like, what a stupid thing. You gave away that piece of history because they thought videotape was so expensive at the time. And I don't want us to do something similar, like give away a piece of our history. So, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's in the lobby or in the, in, the, um, garden. in the garden area or kept in the warehouse, I like the idea of keeping it. Um, but that's what we're But if you put it in the garden, garden, don't you have to put it a shelter over we, it? We would have to come up with a shelter over it and then determine how much we would spend. I kind of low bid it at around a couple hundred dollars, you know, just kind of one of those little plastic ones that would, you know, even that would deteriorate over time and have to be replaced. And I worry that there would be, well, more that the insects and the birds would continuously damage it. Well, I have this old Toyota truck that I hadn't done any with, we except drive it once about twice a year in the whole bed. It was covered with lichen. That's how bad it was. Really? Yeah. We just finally took it in. That was the last time I'd been 19, uh, 20, 2007. Yeah. And I took it in and they had it cleaned and I was so amazed. My husband had a detail. I thought, oh my God, it was gone. Because <laughs> yeah. like, that thing is amazing. But you're right. It deteriorates a lot. So um, I'd kind of like to know if we can get some, I don't know, has staff talked about it in the lobby or? Um, if you talk to staff, a lot of them like that. I think they, I think the mechanics, imagine if somebody, if your friend wanted to park his RV in front of your house and you said, yeah, sure. And then seven years later, it's still there. You, you're, you, you, you've seen it enough. So that's the mechanics point of view. A lot of the staff know that it doesn't really hold up for this slow drive in a parade, that yeah. that's not yeah. gonna cut it, it's gonna overheat. Yeah. And it's it's cantankerous, it's an older mm -hmm. vehicle, it's not the same. And I think people like it, I think staff like it, it's a part of their history. And some of them suggested, hey, stick it in the lobby. And I looked into it and it'll fit, it'll get through the doors. And we'll have to take the mirrors off, but you know, it'll get through and then take the fluids out so it's not leaking oil in the, in the lobby. But I think we can make a clever display for it. And then is there a way to gather old pictures of it in parades or being used? Or you can make this fabulous video because we can be so good at that. Mm -hmm. We can show the kids. We're going to show a little one a little bit in just a couple minutes. So. Well, I would hate to see us lose it. And if the, the, if the minimal we could do is, like um, Jim said, keep it where it is to talk for now and maybe start a fundraising thing for it. Um, 
Well, and even if we were to put it in the lobby, if the, if the committee or the board wanted to do that, that doesn't mean it's forever. I mean, we could put it in the lobby until Tannis, Tannis figures things out, and then it can be relocated to where it has more, you know, oh, I like that. comprehensive yeah, historical significance, not just the water district, but other things. So, <laughs> I just don't. I I would. I just don't see it in the lobby as as a showcase. Put it in the garden with a thing over it. Some Tannis guy has some use for it. I, that would be acceptable. Spending any money to refurbish it, get it up to running, that makes no yeah. sense at all. Uh, I don't care about selling it one way or the other, personally, but uh, I just, I, I think there could be something else put in the lobby that had more uh, visual appropriateness and better utilize the space. But that's so, just me. I don't know if you caught what Chris said, but we've had some conversations about other thoughts, things that we could put in the lobby. Uh -huh. So maybe we can play around with that to say, hey, what else could be in yeah. the lobby? And if, if putting the Jeep in there would preclude those things, then maybe it's not a good use. Yeah, so right. If, no, if, if we can do this and good, that. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Well, maybe we'll play with that. Yeah, play with what else we could put there. Because, we, you know, right, we had, for I the would... longest time, we had that uh, hyperponic display. Mm -hmm. And that seemed appropriate. And then that left. Yeah. I don't know. Quite why, but it, it was gone. Deteriorates. It's yeah. a bit sterile right now. The lobby isn't. It's it? It's yes, it is. Sterile. Yes, it is. So it needs. And it doesn't something. have that much available space to even do, you know, posters and things. It's yeah. kind of limited. So. Well, there's not a lot of wall space. A lot of windows and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very, very, secretary. You know, in, in, and in defense, though, it's <laughs> it's a lobby going to some place. It's not wasn't. I don't think that a design for a show place right. or you know uh, anything like that. You go in, you go to do your, you go to your departments, you leave. Okay, so Except take a look and there. bring something back. And yeah, we'll we, why don't we plan on what? Because Glenn's got some good ideas and Lisa's doing some research on some things. All right, let's do that. Let's have you do further research yeah. and see. And the, but before we conclude this, I'd like to hear what Michael has to say. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't. Did I put it? You put it. You four. have. Yes, this is number two. You did. Yeah, you have no opinion. It's four that I wanted, not two. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Okay, okay, good. Well, the good thing is that it didn't seem like either of the committee members like the, the top three. No. <laughs> so the full restoration, uh, no. the keep in operating condition, and the auction don't appear. No. Maybe so keep it, and it's a matter of where. Yeah. Okay. So between the other. <clears throat> All, right. All right, number three. Um, yeah, that was Send just the uh, from the PAP committee um, last meeting. Um, Director Evans had requested some information on the cost of the various children's programs that we do with the okay. schools. And they are listed there. Jack's Pond, really pretty limited expenses, just staff time. We pay for the bus to bring the children there, so 235 Same thing with going out to Tannis' place, hands-on history. Just a short amount of time, we pay for the bus to go out there. Um, we do pay for a green machine to come out uh, to schools by the San Diego County Office of Education. That one costs five hundred and twenty-six dollars per visit. Splash Lab is seven thirty-three dollars per visit, but that one I get uh, up to I think four of them. It's either three or four, I don't remember. Um, the County Water Authority pays half, mm -hmm. so that one's you know reduced on, on uh, at least up to three of them. And then when, when we have the students come and we have staff here, it's, it's a great chunk. It's uh, about $3,200, mostly just staff time and our overhead. And we do, again, pay mm -hmm. for the buses. But usually those are two buses, because usually we have to, you know, uh, two groups come out. So that's just the expenses for those, uh, those programs. Um, I have a question on that. Sure. So when you do the Splash Lab, you were saying Four. Does that mean you do it four times a year? Is that what you're saying? We do up to, you know, we can do up to like six. Mm -hmm. That's what they'll allocate towards us. But if a school doesn't, if nobody asks for it, right. I don't do so anything. So we can do up to six with a half reverse reimbursement from, is we, that what you're saying? We can do up to six is what we're basically allocated by the Office of Education and okay. the, the Water Authority will help pay for half of three of them. 
Okay, so so. Why but they're still a pretty good deal. And when you do the splash lab, I'm just curious about how many individuals are we reaching? That's usually a whole grade, and that one's oftentimes more at a middle school. Middle so school? it's, oh, yeah? you know, sixth grade. Okay. So multiple, multiple students get to attend that. All right. And then when we do the school tours, is there about how many of those do we do? You've got it here. The tour costs three thousand and all right, thirty-two hundred dollars. So approximately how many are we? Maybe doing? as many as six. Um, typically, we'll only do them every other month. Okay. Mostly because what we're really impacting. It doesn't impact water operations so much. They can have some students come in and talk to them for a few minutes. But it really does pull uh, collection staff off their work trying to maintain the, the sewer system. Okay. And he has, uh, you know, Eric's got goals he's trying to meet as far as getting through our system and keeping it clean and operating. And that's the one that takes, that, that's, that's the one that impacts the staff the most. Okay. In that he's taking a crew off of mm -hmm. working and having them stay in the yard in the morning. And about how many are we putting through on a school tour? So that's With usually two, two bus loads. So I, I typically say it's about 36 students or so per bus, so about 72 show up. Okay, we usually so break them into groups of three. Yeah. So we've each got about 20, 30 kids with us. Alicia, myself, and Lisa will take them in groups of three, rotate between the points of giving a tour of the garden, um, collections and water operations and we've made some adjustments over the years we used to talk to them first and then take them over but Eric requested hey can you just bring them over first and then we get the crews out that much quicker yeah yeah that was an easy adjustment so we you know we just talk and make changes yeah well I, I think they're important and I think even though we go oh, they're just the kids I think there's a lot of carry into the future yeah, you know, no, changing that's, minds that's, yep, and yep, impressing. Exactly. I think they're real, really important, and I'm. I understand totally why we have to limit them yes. because that's not a special. Um, and then on the open houses and the half day water academies, we're running approximately how many people? So now? this is this is something I want to talk to the two of you about. Is we've we've done an annual um, water academy it's in the fall, right. scheduled for October twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. But there's been ideas and talk, and in fact, I think we're looking at uh, um, strategic plan and business plan. One of the comments in there was, you know, open house. And maybe open house turned into water academy, but open house could essentially be a half day where we don't get people's full commitment for a full day, mm -hmm. which some people cannot do. They just can't yeah. commit to it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe do the half day. And almost like I just talked about with the school tour, where they're going to visit these three locations, the garden, water ops, collections. Uh, we can maybe throw in a fourth one if we wanted to include construction or something like that. But show them around our offices, but we, we don't have the expense of the bus of yeah. taking them out and around yep, yep. and turn them loose at a half day and we could decide whether or not to um, feed them you know a little snack at breakfast or do we want to do breakfast and a lunch my thought on that is the benefit of feeding people is immeasurable that you know people after they've been given a free lunch or you know, much happier. Yeah, they're oh, happy yeah, people. Yeah, I agree. And the food's good. And, and <coughs> yeah. I think one of the really good things I see when we do our water academy is the staff all go out and they sit and they talk with the, yeah. with the customers mm -hmm. and we interact and we yeah. engage. And I think there's a lot of benefit to that. I think that that's really critical. And, and I think that open house, now, what would that open house uh, additional cost be if we did that on a Saturday so that that's included there and really and, and what I'm spelling out is the the amount of staff and we typically would have three salaried staff and two of them are here with you Glenn and James and then Ed would typically be with us on a Saturday mm -hmm. uh, they're salaried so they don't get stuck we don't you know there's no extra expense <laughs> for uh, them to show up on a but Saturday we pay them <laughs> amazing yeah. salaries, so. but uh, for re your regular staff on a Saturday it'd be at time and a half yeah. and mm -hmm. then if you wanted to do it on a Sunday which I wouldn't recommend yeah. mm -hmm. it would be double time no, no, so no, I, I, don't I don't think that one plays out yeah no but you know there's there's the and I even brought my calculator in case you wanted me to calculate out something further 
But my just my thought is, we may run out of individuals that can attend the full day academy. You know, we've we've promoted this, uh -huh. done this for years, and I like it. But I just worry that there's going to be this one day where, you know, we can't. You know, just people are busy. Yeah, they just can't get the day off. But maybe we try this as an option in the other season in the spring. We do a half day. Well, yeah, that rolls. It, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. My and we could, we could do it either on a Saturday or on a weekday. And then, uh, I know, I think a Saturday would be perfect that way uh -huh. because I think some of the reasons that I've heard is, well, you know, weekdays I can't, I can't get off on yeah. a day. But a Saturday, half day is perfect. Uh, and so I think we should try it and see what happens on a half day open house. Take them to the three places, feed them a little kind of breakfast, give them lunch, chat with them. I think, they're gonna, I think that we're going to see that that's going to be probably more Attended. attended than and our varied. academy. And I think you'll start to see where more of like a family wants to come. It's like the fire department doing open house. I mean, yeah. once the kids get excited, you can might, they'll go many times to meet who's ever there and do that. I'd like to suggest too, a, a Sunday, I agree, is totally out and I think Saturday is perfect. But something as we go along that you might look into or just watch feedback on is sometimes people don't go because it's just hot and sunny. So I don't know if we can have some in the time of year in the summer where we actually do a later open house. So people are coming and stay, you know, like we're, we're light until a certain time. And I, I don't know if that changes the staff price any if it's night or day. No, I don't really. But right. maybe like an early afternoon evening just to I don't know something to just consider and then you're saying the three places would be the garden here and the garden water operations and collections that's what we do with the students but yeah. you know we could throw in a fourth but I was going to say have we ever would we have, maybe we need to consider at some point having a random open house at Meadowark absolutely yeah. Just a metal like tour. Yeah. I think that would be fascinating, especially when you just recently had all those articles in the paper about, you know, the trash that shows up the floss and the yeah. don't throw yeah. your contacts in yeah. the toilet and all yeah. these kind of funny little things. I think if those sorts of things, I think it would be interesting. It's a random, it's a try. And now if we go to half days, could we then do more of them? I, I, I don't see why not. And, and I think, if they go I think, well, I'd like to see that. I think that's the thing is, why don't we try it and see what happens, and I then, then we'll know idea. a lot more. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful idea. Yep. Yeah, they went in the spring. And, and um, Director Evans, I, I get concerned about you know doing it. I don't want to do it in the summer when it's really hot, and I don't want to do it on a rainy day. And last year's Water Academy, it's in the fall, which can be hot, but it was pretty fabulous weather. And, I was taking credit you know for the what? good you weather that to, day. I understand that. You do the best you can. I'm just saying, when some people and it's all day and they know it's a bus and it's walking and it's hot, it just, it's too much. Some of them are fatigued. And it sounds very serious as the academy, whereas I think open house, that's like, yeah. oh, I can come, yeah. I can come. go, I can yeah. stay. So I we're not leave. looking for people to reserve a spot or anything. It's a true yeah. open house. Yeah, yeah I think that's, house. don't you yeah. think that's a good idea? Yep. Yeah. I, I think do. that we'll do what, I think that Worth was, trying. Yeah. Worth trying. And then I could make this really cool costume and Jim could come as a drip. <laughs> <laughs> I could come as a, drip, as a plastic bottle with a big sign across, you know, drink Yeah, big international no sign. <laughs> yeah. Do we, do we need to go back to the board? <laughs> Uh, the, the whole board, or we just put in a I spring? So. I, I sort of yeah. think so too. You're talking like just six months off, probably six yeah. months. Six after months the, yeah. uh, after the water. I academy think we can just say in the policy that that I, in our report Maybe. that we um, thought it would be great for you to try an open house instead of an academy. I don't think that needs to have the whole board. I don't think not do instead, a but in addition to. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're yeah. still going to do the water academy in the fall, but yeah. we're yeah. going to add. We're going to yeah. add the open house. Yeah. 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 Now, sure. now, just to clarify, are we sending a recommendation for this, or we're just going to do it? 
I don't think we need to send a recommendation. Okay. I don't think they need to vote on it. All right. We can put it together. I, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. then, Godfrey, let's yeah. just yeah, do it. Yeah, let's do it. We made a decision. All right. Okay. So you, and it's um, not increasing the budget. I work on Saturday in the spring. <laughs> yeah, I, I work for food, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. So, so, get a lunch out of it. Oh, and um, feed lunch? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think, the food, like, I think it's well, really helpful. It doesn't have to be like we do the yeah, yeah just the same and then yeah. have a real lunch. Yeah. You know? I mean, hey, I think that's essential. We can just give them well, deep fried pickles wrapped yeah. with bacon, yeah. and they'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's <laughs> a tricky part. Is it's, watch it. it's tougher watch to figure yeah. out the uh, <laughs> the homeless here about the lunch thing if they don't really have a count. But yeah, that's the thing. If people aren't reserving a space, you have no clue how many people show up. Actually, there's a couple open houses for consultants that I've been to that they they posted hey well food is available until it's gone yeah you know so yeah there we go there you so know it's like you don't expect you're not guaranteed to get food but we're going to make our best attempt yeah. yeah there you go okay thanks so. thanks james I, all right I think that'll play on well yeah. all right and then i'll bring in a couple of the street taco people outside so if they don't get it here they can go buy them yeah put a truck yeah. out there at the corner we, did, we could do the jeep we can have giant hot dogs oh, <laughs> okay number four thanks Agriculture water eligibility. This okay. one, so this is awesome. I, I did talk uh, briefly that Alicia in your video, so we're going to see one in a little bit. But Anne, would you be able to bring up the PowerPoint up there? You like PowerPoint first? PowerPoint first, yeah. And then, uh, then we'll reduce it and then show her video. So go ahead and put it in uh, play mode. There's a couple extra slides that are in here in case you have, if, if there's a refresher that's needed. Okay. But this is where we, we brought in to the board the information about there's that temporary special agricultural water rate that the water authority uh, manages through us where people get a discounted rate. But then there's also what we call our certified non-participating agricultural water rate. And this came about during the 2007-2009 uh, drought and some customers really petitioned the district to be able to get an ag rate where you wouldn't have these cutbacks. They are really afraid of the cutbacks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The water authorities, one has that percentage cutback and that can really impact somebody's business. So it was initially referenced in Ordinance 165 back in 2009 and we, we initially put the same parameters on it as the water authority had put, whereas you had to be in the program that was the requirement. You had to have multiple acres, closely dented uh, plants, and so forth. Commercial operation, not just a homeowner wanting to grow some carrots in their little garden. And I brought copies of Ordinance 165 if you want copies of it. And I highlighted the specific text for both of you. But, uh, you know, that's basically how it was spelled out. Well, over the years, the, the, the language just changed, and the most recent ordinance, 207, just doesn't mention it. It's just silent on the subject of certified, non-participating agricultural water. And but, do we know why? No, you don't. You know, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Uh, and will you go on to the next slide? So, previous ordinances... Chris, just for clarity, did, did the latest ordinance re Ordinance 165? Uh, well, the, it's it's a series of replacements. Right. So and ultimately, each each it one came each from one replaced. Yeah, okay. and so it's it's multiple remove and replace, remove and replace, remove and replace. And after several iterations, boom, it just disappeared. Yeah, just just the language, just uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I can't explain it. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, but the practice has been people would contact me. I, I I'm your public information guy. I'm your water conservation guy, but I wear this third hat over here of being the ag water guy, and people talk to me about agricultural water all the time, and people will, customer services will usually refer them to me if, if a customer calls and wants to talk about ag water, and customers have called in the past, and I've referenced the ordinance that was on the books at the time and said, you know, here's why I can't, you know, offer you the agricultural water rate, it's because it's grandfathered in, and you just can't get it, and I'm sorry. So the current ordinance 207 is silent on the subject. So let's go ahead and go on to the next one. Uh, Bobby Case had come by. He had requested the agricultural water rate. 
I went to tell him why, and he said, can you send me a copy of the ordinance? I looked at it, doesn't say anything. He purchased those 13 acres up on uh, 872 Flynn Heights. Um, it was raw, unimproved lands. It's, it's zoned for agriculture, um, but he intended to uh, farm six of the 13 acres. And Anne, will you take us to the next one? Because I think I have an aerial view. That's the property right there. You can mm -hmm. see uh, eucalyptus and low chaparral, but just kind of, you know, unimproved property. And then I've got an additional slide, Anne, if you move it, and that shows the shape of the actual um, property itself. Oh, that's interesting. So we approved him to, um, he had wanted to have a meter put in, and he got, uh, he got water service, because there was no water service there. There was a meter, but no service. So now he got water service, but we still haven't given him an agricultural rate at this point. And so his meter, still, is and it a one inch or two inch? Or? It was small, yeah, it was like what? a one inch meter. That's, yeah. that, that's well, one inch is agricultural. That's kind of where you built, huh? That's Farmer Fred. I used to live right, you see it says Flynn, Flynn Heights, Heights Drive. Yeah. That's, your, that's my property right next to it. Wow. You it used to be. Oh. Yeah, no, no, it used to be. Yeah. But then it, we call him Farmer Fred. and. Uh, and then he bought that piece up. Now, is he on agricultural rate at his exist down there? Don't you know? Um, different customers, I don't know. Because okay. this is a new guy who bought that land. I well, wasn't really researching. Oh, this that. is. Oh, that's just the yeah. name of the road. It's not the same guy. No, no, no. Oh, see this guy's little, case. You yeah, see yeah, the I see. Little line down yeah, there? yeah, I, I see that. I believe he, he was the one that came in and talked to our meeting. He did. Right. He right. Came yeah. talk. Okay. Okay. I believe oh, he has yeah. an existing five-eighths, or maybe we just put in three-quarter inch. Uh -huh. yeah. I was going to say, I thought at the inch. meeting yeah. he implied it was less than an inch, because yeah. an inch would normally go for agriculture, so I'm surprised we didn't put an inch in anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's kind of odd to me. Well, and there wasn't... I mean, mine is to the two and a half acres as an inch, because it was an egg zone, even though right. it's, I mean, it's only personal egg on there. Yeah. So yeah. his request is still pending. Yeah. Okay. Um, and will you go ahead and scroll on to the next one? So, and we had the two representatives that came to the mm -hmm. board meeting from right. Pacto Canoco, um, Kazakeda, and Brish Ibarra. And Lisa, myself, and Alicia went out to visit their site. And we got a really thorough tour, and Alicia made a quick little video out of it. I'm not going to go on and on. It's it only lasts about place. a minute, but it's the mushroom mm -hmm. place. Yeah. And my point being on this entity is you know i've seen a lot of agricultural groves and they produce a crop once per year this thing's going all the time and uh if you can reduce it in and switch over to the i didn't install it in it just reduce and it's just about a minute long but it's uh alicia put this together real quick and that's the big building out in twin oaks valley yeah right. yeah everyone goes what is that uh -huh. Ooh, gag orders. Oh, mm. They're growing shrooms in there, huh? <laughs> I see Alicia over there smiling. Huh? <laughs> wow. Two miles of conveyor belts. Gee. interesting because I toured the one out uh, on North Broadway. Mm. Holy mackerel. That's barbaric compared to this. Yeah. I mean, it's just racks of... Right. Aren't you guys yeah, in yeah, hand cutting them yeah. and such? Mm. Wow. So, you know, that's that entity. Probably one of the... F Honestly, one of the funnest days uh, I've had, you know, just working, just, just yeah. how interesting it was. Oh, yeah. A lot of protocols, uh, I guess they make four types of uh, uh, fungus, because I think one of them isn't really what you call a mushroom. It's a fungus rather than a mushroom. Mm. And they'll, the mushrooms will battle each other, and so you've got to keep them very separate. Mm. And so they had us, you know, gowned and then stepping in pools of... Uh, like, uh, like disinfectant to keep the shoes clean yeah, yeah, and so yeah, yeah. forth. Uh -huh. But you know, massive building, multiple stories. Oh wow! And, yeah, I know uh, it's a big building. You know, a lot of production. 
so we can go back to the PowerPoint. So that's Hokto Kanoko, and they had, they had requested. And, uh, sure. And can you put us back in the slide and presentation? And currently, mode? they're not agricultural. Because they're not. they came in after. They're there that same night that Bobby was there. Yeah, right, I do the remember. They're not agricultural, and they kept. They couldn't go on the TSA or anything if they wanted to because they, they cannot. Yeah, they could not. Yeah. Um, and because why that choice was made, I don't know. It was a previous company that owned the structure, but they just set it up as a commercial account. So that's the story with it. Um, yeah, go ahead and slide on. That's one of the shots. Um, Christopher Peters, he called me just the other day. He's buying 2.5 acres on Washingtonia. I've, I've got his letter here. I'll just let you take copies of it. Basically, he was asking, he wants to have his landscape architect out. Um, he just purchased it. His plan was to grow something on the property, but he doesn't know what to do. He's, he can't really move forward at this point. Mm -hmm. Not being able to get an ag rate. And I said, look, I'm gonna go talk to a board committee and I'll, I'll maybe follow up when I, uh, when I get some additional direction. But there's his big property up on Washingtonia. Uh, kind of up near where our latest main break was. And two and a half acres there. And Anne, can you go ahead and go on to the next one? Um, Liz Bolton, this one was pretty interesting. Um, Liz Bolton's mother came to talk to me and uh, she was asking about agricultural water for stables located at 3725 Camino Mayor. Uh, I think that's where the meter's at, but the actual um, properties on a different street. Um, but if you scroll to the next one, and you know, this is Liz Bolton's stables, and she's got over 50 horses, and she's asking about an agricultural water rate. That's a website. So that's another one that's kind of pending, wanting to know. They had just got the property. The mother had come in to pay uh, the water bill because there was she was going to have a big event out there and didn't have water on at the property. And, so she came in to, to, to pay it. So the, so they just bought they just bought that property, and uh, you know mom mom paid and got it set up. And and uh, Miss Bolton I guess was leaving. I don't know where that is. What's that now? The street sounds familiar, but I just don't know where it is. I was just trying to think of the same thing. Oh, Camino Mayor. I bet it's up in Twin Oaks. So yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, I want to say it sounds familiar. I just yeah. can't picture it. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's another one that's kind of pending right there. And then Discovery Island Palms, Joe Dombrowski called me on the 7th. So what's today? It's like two weeks later. He wanted for his business. He's located at 915 Discovery. His, his company is Discovery Island Palms. And, and if you slip to the next one, that's some of the stuff, some of the pictures from his website. So he's got a palm tree nursery that he's got. And he's asking for the same thing. Tank. Can there? It's where? North what? Northeast or north 40 million big gallon tanks. tank, no big tanks. Community. Okay, okay. So yeah. it's up on the hills. Mm -hmm. And then will you go ahead I and roll on it? So mm -hmm. the fiscal impact of it, well, every, every case is going to be different and mm -hmm. depends on how many you allow and so forth. The crux of it is the, the certified non-participating agricultural water rate. It's all tier two. They're mm -hmm. just billed at tier two. They're never even billed at tier one, which is the lower rate. They're just mm -hmm. tier two flatline across the board. That's what it costs. It's what, 4.43 per HCF. Um, but if you get that rate, you never get pushed into the tier three. We just kind of flatline it mm -hmm. at the tier two rate. And so the economic impact is, uh, Director Martin was specifically asking about that. Well, it's every unit of tier three water that you would have charged, you're gonna see a reduction of $4 four cents. Mm -hmm. So depending on what that customer uses, that's that's how much um, it would be and it depends and on the how many customers with that in. unit the total units how many? used how many units used times the four dollars and well, four cents? Like for the mushroom place you're yeah, talking yeah. about? Or? They get into it quite a bit. So um, I mean hundreds there's of like units? four different account meters on the property at uh, the mushroom farm. There's two big uh, two inch meters. And then they have um, one for just, I think, irrigating the grounds and then they also have a fire service line. So, yeah, but do we have uh, any data on 
how many units they've used over the last year per month? They're one we of could our get it. biggest water users, and we we could get it. Yeah, I, I think I that can, would be I important can, to get so that yeah. we know, because I mean, if they're using a thousand units, yeah, I mean, anything over sixteen, right? It goes into tier three. Well, it depends on the meter size. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, in a one inch, it would it would be they use sixty units, I think, before it goes to three. I think you're right. Or maybe it's okay. sixty before you go to two. It's sixty. Anyway, I think you can go sixty. Okay. Yeah. So. I can see the challenge there because I mean, people in the little farm or their two and a half it, orchard, they may use a lot because it's an orchard versus the staple that uses water differently, but we're talking big. Um, we need to do some research, but I think the biggest challenge in front of us is figuring out how to address that. I think the 2009 cutoff is not appropriate. I think the world has changed so much from 2009. I think small agricultural things, I mean even like the three acre vineyards, those didn't exist right. like they do. So I think, and I think that if people are doing, trying to do a business and provide for a community, I think we should do something for agriculture. Now maybe it turns out we have it that it's not at rate two. Maybe we come up with our own rate and it's somewhere between, you know, two and, and three or something. Or or, or, we, or we do tiers or we do within the tiers. agriculture. I mean I gotta believe I gotta be <clears throat> I gotta believe even with the two inch meter, they're using hundreds of units a month. And so what is that differential? I don't certainly think they should be charged at a commercial rate where you know everything goes, but yeah. uh, I think we need more data on just what kind of revenues are we talking about. I mean, you know, for well, the and for a for a you know the a homeowner, they may not have a whole lot of tier three, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mushroom farm, yeah, probably a lot, a, a lot, but again, what what's I have people asking, can I get the ag rate? And I'm, and, and I'm at this point saying, oh, yeah, there's can't. nothing for me to say. No, 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 I don't have anything to, to point to them to say, no, you can't have it. Except and that you're I, not I, here at when you can't have it because it was closed in 2009. That's what previous ordinances exactly. said. Uh, and that's what's existing. Right. And then it disappeared. So when it disappears, to me, that tells you, we don't even have it. Yes, exactly. That's how I look at it. I mean, I on my, on my it. one acre, I, I put in a garden this year. <laughs> I haven't been, I haven't been to two, tier two, all year long. I've been to tier three, on a number of months. Sure. And so, it would have been cheaper to go to Whole Foods. But I do think, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think I would have to agree with you. Oh wait a minute. Oh, so. Oh. I think I've got one more, and it was really yeah. kind of the pros and cons. And the, cool. the pros are it really helps these ag customers. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. And uh, there's not a lot of more pros to it than that. It helps them with their business. Mm -hmm. The con is that we lose the revenue at the tier three rate. Yeah, and and that's it's really it's it's this and it's this. Well, uh, you know how much is that? What revenue are we losing? Yeah, and that's what we, and, I think I'd like to know. And my feelings on tier three are. The reason we have such high rates at tier three is we're asking for conservation. If we can s supply water and they're conserving it and they're making it's a business, at two, I mean, it's a matter of do you punish them for if they're conserved being, you know, what am I trying to say? Water efficient. Right, and I and I and I'll, and if there is a way that the if the mushroom place can be more water efficient, then yes, it's. I don't have such a problem with saying, you know, you gotta pay more for the that third rate. But if they're being as efficient as they can be, just like our farmers who are all constantly spending money to be efficient, then I feel like there's some way we can address that. And it's not just that we lost some revenue, we may have lost some th third tier revenue but we may actually have people who use more at the second tier, and so we're still selling our water, but not ridiculously. Yeah, I don't know. The, it's, it's complicated to me. Well, and the the point on the the mushroom farm, um, and can you go back a couple slides because I think I, I think it'll show in that one picture that we I did stick in here, or at least it was. Uh, it, I think you probably saw it in Alicia's video. But the mushrooms are grown in these bottles. They're yeah, I saw that. In a bottle, and so, 
and they're stacked vertically in rooms and so you know the irrigation and it's mostly kind of a misting kind of thing you know it's going into the bottle mm -hmm. but then it's going into the one underneath it mm -hmm. so it's not like there's flood irrigation or anything yeah. it's an efficient oh yeah I it's, gotta it's efficient it. irrigation yeah. but they're turning they're growing um, they're growing these things and it takes water to have that happen yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. and then my other thought is not so much for the mushroom place but some of the smaller places I feel like I don't know if it includes enforcement, but I certainly wouldn't want to turn 872 into ag an ag rate and then find out five years down the road he never planted the dragon plants or whatever he was going to do. Yeah. Or he planted them once and they're done and he's still getting whatever he wants. Well, right. that and may that's be an ex extra cost to us to kind of monitor that, yeah. but well, I, the garden or any even any of them, you have to an audit of some kind. I would you not, have to audit it. I wouldn't let the customer. We wouldn't let the customer have the rate until they Perform. proved that they had mm -hmm. the standard acreage that we expect and that it was growing, you know, it was going concern that it was an okay. actual farm. And so the, the Christopher Peters guy, he doesn't have anything growing yet, but he's, he's saying, well, can I get it? You know, can, yeah, I, right. can I design okay, this? Well, I don't know. Unless we certify that they have it yeah. and they maintain yeah. it. Yeah, and the same thing with uh, Bobby Case. I haven't inspected the property yet, you know. Yeah, but so, I, think it, I think it would be fair to have a program that guarantees the people that they would get the rate if they met certain conditions. Yes, right. absolutely. Because they need I that think commitment that's a real before strong they And I would be kind of cautious about establishing an acreage, really, because some of these, uh, what do they call them, uh, miniature plants? Bonsai. No, not bonsai, oh. but the, they're vegetables and the little teeny guys, the carrots. And yeah, all it's, that. It's, it's, it's the... Hydroponics? No, it's, it's the, the micro It's the, it's the oh, micro yeah, okay. yeah, there you go, yeah. I mean, they're doing that in, in 10,000 square feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and making some serious dollars. So mm -hmm. I, I just caution on that one issue. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, putting it all together and then getting some numbers. And I'm going to show, I took the picture. Um, Kind of down Twin Oaks, there's a property that used to be a hydroponics place. Oh yeah, that's oh, the Dutch place. Know you know yeah. what I'm talking about, yeah. right? And, and, and I think marijuana is going I, there. Well, right now I don't think anything's <laughs> in there, but I think well, it has I don't failed. Think we allow marijuana in. I think it has stuff. failed several times in that it's a it's a greenhouse yeah. that probably should have an ag rate, but it's been being commercial yeah. rates mm -hmm. on the yeah. water. And it's still, yeah, no, you I, know, for lease. Oh, no, uh, yeah, I had that big strawberries in there and something. Well, they, uh, and then uh, it disappeared. It disappeared. It yeah, disappeared. In, yeah. Indoor plants for a long time. Yeah. Well, <coughs> Dutch growers used to be there, whoever they are. So, but, yeah. Well, I don't know what to tell people. We're, <laughs> we're working on it. You do. And <laughs> I can come back <laughs> to the board and. It's and, not and available and it will take time. Okay. But. Well, I, I think. Don't you think you'd come back to us? Well, I, I'm hearing oh, right. we need to go back and dust off the kind of the policy or the ordinance yeah. that existed at we the time. We need to see what there was. Yeah, yeah. And, and then try to bring it forward to today's. When Sarah. he's done, I was just going to say, um, can we verify on our end if they pulled the permit with the city of San Marcos? Because don't they have the, aren't they required by the city to put, the city has to require a permit? For agricultural, agricultural well, okay. some of them might not be in the city limits, so... A lot of these would yeah. be county. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, how, would we, we, how would we verify that they're a customer? Right. What That's would a our good verification question. process Certified. be? Yeah. So there's a lot of questions. So we need to pull out the old ordinance, see what it was, and we need to see why it was canceled, why it was, why there was the logic of the 2009. Right. And then, because I do think times have changed yeah. a, a lot. And then I think we'd also need to check how would we certify, how would we pop different tier options, what do we lose in money, what do we gain. I think there's more to it than just that they get to grow our commercial businesses. I mean, I think it would be great to pursue. I just want to Maybe make sure we'll I get the takeaways to bring back to either the committee yeah. Or the um, board. What? I think you should bring back Because, I mean, maybe we, you want to see the billing history of, of right. the mushroom farm. Yeah. That's okay. That's one. So, bring okay. back the old ordinance. And when you say old, what? Well, the, the Pre original the one. The 167 had the, uh, ordinance. That one's, that one's participating. 165. Oh, that's, that's 165. Of oh, the one you gave us with the yellow Yeah, but once. Yeah. Yeah, but. <clears throat> 
And you I can get, I can give you two oh seven, but it's just silent. It just doesn't say anything. Oh, it doesn't say anything. Um, you know what? We have it here. Okay. Now. And two oh seven doesn't say anything about what. It doesn't say anything about certified non-participating okay. agricultural water. It does say some. There's some text in there about, about the TSAWR water, but right. it just it just ignores this. Okay, and I this one. I don't want to call this that long name anymore. So we'll come up with <laughs> certified non-participating. We could we could what? just we could just call it uh, Valacitos Ag Water or something okay. like that. Yeah, this is no. ridiculous. No, I guess I can read this. I'll be happy to read it. But as staff, I'd like them to come back and tell me exactly if they could, because you're so good at this, and I know you have tons of spare time. <laughs> tell me what was the intent of it, and what and why there was a cutoff, if you know. Just simple. And um, I, I'm i assuming it just disappeared, and when it disappeared was 10207, because nobody thought it applied more. It's like, those people, nobody can get in. Everybody that's here is here. Maybe, yeah. I mean, that would make logic, because it doesn't exist, obviously, yeah, yeah. currently. And then I would like to, you know, I can read all this, but I don't necessarily, in reading it, always understand what those repercussions or yeah. why they did what they did. Yeah, what was the intent? What were they and, trying to achieve? And then the, a history of the, a couple of places, maybe a, 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 like, a place that's in existence that's not, the mushroom garden's one, but it's so, the mushroom is so big. A smaller place that's currently alive and well, but they're paying us, what would the difference be for them? What was their history? What would it have been? What would we have lost of them if the last five years they had been on tier two only? Okay, so maybe that a maybe this guy's property. Yeah, well, yeah. He just bought it, and I can go look at what the previous. That would be great. Using. Okay. Something to say. Okay, and how would not only just tell us how it impacts us, how it impacts them, and what are the benefits of that? Yeah. Now the previous owner probably didn't necessarily have an orchard. So that's you know well, then change we'll, things. We'll take a look at one. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's a good example. Or the stable. Yeah. Here's the guy that's asking. How yep. long has yeah. the stable been there? Yeah. But what what would it mean to? I mean, you can look and tell what the difference. Yeah. Some some data. Yeah. I think we have a speaker. So we come. Am I coming back to the committee or do I? I think we have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we have a, a mic. I didn't forget you. Yeah, okay. So I was. I think one of the concerns. Is a public relations disaster from saying we're not getting any more water from anywhere, which is what the San Diego County Water Authority has mentioned. There's no new water. So all of this water has to come from somewhere, and we're being committed to cut back on indoor residential use. So this water has to come from somewhere, and it is un rational according to what everyone's talking about. It's not subject to rationing and it gets a lower rate than what the residential will get. It seems like having that sort of combination is a uh, potential for disaster because when we had the last big drought problems, the Central Valley, the farmers went to high value crops, which were high water consumption crops, and they drained the Central Valley groundwater substantially. Mm -hmm. There are possibilities of crop changes, and if you have a fixed fee for water, no second tier, no rationing, then you have the makings of both a physical and public relations disaster. So where is the water going to come? What happens if the crops changes? And uh, how are we going to square this with the residential user? I guess if I can offer a few things, there's there's not a direct connection between the new restrictions and limitations on indoor water use and water supplies. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no connection. This is a state mandated program that they think is the best thing to do. And they think it'll put less pressure on the water supply. So that, that's true. So, but in the new water use restrictions that also t mandate the 55 gallons per capita per day, it also says that they're going to develop standards for outdoor use. So things like agricultural will fall under certain limitations, whether you want to call it a water budget or whatever yeah. you want to call it. 
So I wouldn't say it's unrestricted use of water. Eventually, by the time the new regulations become effective, there'll be restrictions on how much you can use per acre per type of crop that you have. So now, as long as any meter sold, is, uh, it's apparent that there will be new restrictions coming along with it in the future. Because that's the state, you know, it, it, yeah. just unrestricted would be a disaster. And if it's presented to the public in any way that they're not subject to rationing, and then they are seeing these plans put in that will really affect them strongly, uh, that's a problem. And that's a, a valid point that we do have to look at how it would handle with the public. But there has to be some give and take on both sides of the public in doing that. You're right, there's limited water. I don't disagree with that. But limited water doesn't mean that I still get to do everything I wanted to do as an individual private private property owner or that they can't ever do what they need to do to have a business. So I think there's a balance, but you're absolutely right. It needs to be shown how it can mutually benefit or provide or mutually share the squeeze or whatever the word is to do that. Yeah, for some crops you have to have a lower rate or yeah, right. basic Staples, uh, well, I don't know involved. that we can get into that personally. I think legally it's not my business to tell anybody what they can or cannot grow. Exactly. I, I can't tell them if you want to spend your water, you have to do it on a shower. Or the other person says, no, I'm going to, that's not what the water district does, Michael. Right. If you want to change those rules, go where it makes a difference. That's your legislation and your governors and your, but we can't do that. That's not our job. Okay. Even though I agree with you and. Okay. All right. Well, that's all we had. That's all we got. Okay. So you're going to come back and we'll discuss uh, the district vehicle. We'll discuss uh, possible open houses. No, you're going to bring that to the board. Do that one. We're right? just going to do that. They're going to do yeah, that yeah. one, and we'll just announce that we've agreed that you should add yeah, an open house. Yeah. And your report out if you guys. Can and do that, that yeah. you're going to look into the pilot project, which we feel you should move forward with. Before we bring that back to us to see where we go with. Let's go back to the board once we. If, yeah. If we'll come back to us. Yeah, it'll, and yeah. then to the board. Yeah, I think. Right. I think. Well, we'll we'll decide after we meet with the VID and get, have a better feel for this, and we'll maybe okay. come back through you guys on the way to the board. Okay. So I'll leave that in your hands, and on the agriculture water, we have some research before we can decide. Yep. Okay. Full agenda. Thank you for your time.